Uh, welcome everybody to our third session on our Sustain Sustainable Economy Day of the World Scientists Warning um, Days on uh, World Scientists Warning Europe Days, Planet in Crisis. Unfortunately, I'm just losing the plot as I've now done that so many times over the last three or four days. I apologize for that. Um, the World Scientists Warnings are very strict about the economy. We have to start moving away from GDP growth at all costs. Uh, the 1992 warning, which was signed by 1,700 scientists at the time, is clear on that, as is the 2017 warning, now signed by more than 20,000 scientists. Um, on the 5th of November last year, when the world scientists issued their warning of climate emergency, um, they split off six stressors to be particularly identified, and we have a day on each of those during our programme currently. Um, the stressor on sustainable economy, um, they described as follows. Excessive extraction of materials and over exploitation of ecosystems driven by economic growth must be quickly curtailed to maintain long term sustainability of the biosphere. We need a carbon free economy that explicitly addresses human dependence on the biosphere and policies that guide economic decisions accordingly. Our goals need to shift from GDP growth and the pursuit of affluence towards sustaining ecosystems and improving human well-being by prioritizing basic needs and reducing inequality. Um, Sean, who's going to be our speaker now, um, was the author of the Transition Towns Movement second book. Um, he was also one of the earliest Extinction Rebellion Aristides. He's the executive producer of 2020 film, the sequel, What Will Follow Our Troubled Civilization? and lead Sterling College's online programme, Surviving the Future, Conversations for Our Time. He's the Managing Director of the Fleming Policy Centre, previously served as Chair of the Ecological Land Cooperative, um, and as a Director of the campaigning organisation, Global Justice Now. Um, he's an advisor, or has been an advisor, to the UK Department of Energy and Climate Change, co-author of the All-Party Parliamentary Report in favour of carbon rationing, um, and he is an absolute expert on why we should be moving away from GDP growth at all costs. So thank you very much, Sean, for coming to do this talk and over to you. Thanks, Edmund. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and thank you for the invitation. Um, so, you know, we're all here in the context of the scientists warning. Um, so I'm not gonna say too much about the context that we find ourselves in. Uh, other than to note that it's incredibly clear that the path we're on is unsustainable. And I like to remind us that unsustainability is not like a soundbite. It's not like, you know, a thing that companies put in their reports, the sustainability chapter. Unsustainable means that the thing in question is going to end. Um, we're in a situation where the majority of the world's vertebrates on earth have gone in the last 50 years and not been replaced. Um, this is in so many ways, we're on an unsustainable trend. So we know that we are on the cusp of radical change. We either change direction radically or we end up where we're headed, which looks radically different from today. So we know that we're on the cusp of radical change. And I think that's a really important thing, not just to say and hear, but to integrate into ourselves, which is, which is a process that takes time because I think there's this really dominant sort of story in our culture that the, the status quo is overwhelmingly powerful and, you know, we really can't change it. You know, we go out on our protests and things, but, you know, basically nothing's really going to change. And at this moment in history, that is absolutely not true. The status quo is unsustainable. The status quo is going to end. And for a whole lot of reasons, it's, it's not gonna to last too much longer. It's, it's crumbling. So our work is not to overthrow it. Our work is to design the sequel to it. Uh, and that I find a much more compelling proposition. Um, and so, as I say, I'm not gonna to talk too much about the ways in which it's unsustainable. Uh, I'm gonna talk more about how we respond to these exceptional moments that we're living through. And one thing to note about trends like the mass extinction crisis unfolding on the planet and so many others is 
that they aren't primarily caused by climate change. I mean, climate change is an absolutely huge issue, as, as we all know and agree. And I've been a climate change campaigner for decades now. Um, but it's really important to notice that even, even if we could click our fingers and make climate change go away, the dominant globalized way of life is unsustainable for a whole lot of other reasons too. And uh, my, my personal journey in response to uh, the, the way that these things were unfolding is that in 2005, I was working, uh, running a learning center for marginalized groups. So drug misusers, people with mental health issues, young asylum seekers. Um, and I quit that job in 2005 because I felt like I was I was helping people to reintegrate with society which felt like really worthwhile work until I realized that society itself was charging headlong off a cliff uh, and at that point I felt like I have to engage with this in some way but I had no idea how <laughs> um, you know what do you do the, the two things that you're always told to do um, both seemed really depressing actually you know one is lobby the decision makers right to MPs and you think well I'm just going to be ignored and, and that doesn't really seem to take me anywhere and the other thing is you know change your personal lifestyle you know fly less change your light bulbs don't drive all of that stuff and I did all of those things but I thought ah, this is not really changing anything either you know the whole world's just plowing on in the opposite direction so yeah what I ended up doing was um learning to live very cheaply um, after quitting my job, not taking another job um, and using the time that that freed up from earning money to read a lot, to go to events, to harass interesting seeming people, um, to just try and figure out what it would look like to live meaningfully in relation to these overwhelmingly vast crises, if that's the word, predicaments maybe. Um, back then I discovered, um, a guy called Rob Hopkins, who was just talking about starting the Transition Towns movement that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, threw myself into that, co-founded Transition Town Kingston in Southwest London, uh, as Ed mentioned, wrote the second book of the movement, uh, and also got involved with sort of advising, um, DEFRA as it was then, who had the climate change brief, uh, on carbon rationing. Um, I met the man David Fleming who invented the idea and uh, working closely with him started advising this because this seemed to me to be the one policy that would allow carbon targets to actually have teeth uh, that would there's an awful lot of talk about setting adequate targets and the targets we have in this country and especially globally are completely inadequate to the scale of the climate challenge as most of you probably know but what's talked about a lot less is that even if we had adequate targets we don't actually have any means for achieving those targets which is obviously a pretty pretty essential part of actually dealing with the problem um and uh this system tax tradable energy quotas that david fleming developed would provide a method for doing that um so it seemed worthwhile at the time to put some time into trying to to see that move into policy uh, as a way of implementing the climate change act but uh, even though we were advising the uh, government feasibility study into the system, um, uh, yeah, to really abbreviate several years of hard work, um, the essential bottom line was the government said, we're not gonna do this because it would threaten economic growth. Um, and in the meantime, I was off in my, you know, in my other time um, doing a lot of environmental direct action, climate camps, earth thirst, reclaim the power, etc. Again, because living very cheaply freed me up for this stuff. But that response from the government really brought home to me um, that the economic systems are, are key if we're going to do any of the things that are necessary to preparing for the sequel to this this collapsing civilization um essentially we're facing what seems from the perspective of our mainstream perspectives to be an impossible dilemma uh like if if growth economic growth gdp growth ends then our economies will collapse uh, and i'm not going to get into all the detail of that but um, there's truth to it. 
uh, our current economic systems are absolutely predicated on growth. Um, and it's, it's easy and a little naive to just say, degrowth will solve all our problems. That degrowth will also bring a lot of problems. There are a lot of reasons why growth is desirable. Uh, there are more important reasons why it's undesirable, but there are a lot of reasons why growth is desirable. Um, and so I have some sympathy with the economists who, you know, defend it at all costs. But as I say, we're in this impossible dilemma because on the one hand, if growth stops, we're looking at a, a collapse type scenario. On the other hand, if growth doesn't stop, we're going to continue growing to the point where we destroy the ecosystems on which all life on earth depends. And again, we're at the point in history where that's becoming agonizingly obvious. So what do we do? Neither option sounds great. Um, and just in case people aren't familiar with the, the arithmetic on growth, um, I think it's very, very simple and very important to understand that 3% growth, which is roughly what economists tell us is necessary to keep this economy from, from falling into depression or worse. Um, simple arithmetically, 3% growth means doubling every 24 years. That's just basic maths. So whenever people talk about 3% growth, for example, think what they're actually saying is we want to double the size of the economy over the next 24 years. Um, you know, twice as much economic activity, twice as much deforestation, twice as much, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's talk of decoupling, uh, which is reducing or reversing GDP growth while increasing outputs. Uh, again, that's not what this talks about. I would say it's been clearly demonstrated to be A, not happening and B, probably not possible on anything like the absolute decoupling scale that we need. So again, it's, it's unreasonable, it's unthinkable to imagine that we're going to be able to support an economy in a couple of decades time that's twice the size of today's. Uh, anyone with even the slightest ecological awareness is aware that that isn't going to happen. Not that it shouldn't happen, that it isn't going to happen. It's unsustainable. Um, and so we're in this dilemma. Growth can't continue, but growth must continue on our current paradigm. Uh, and this is why I stopped working on climate policy, actually, because I could see that we were never going to get any meaningful, adequate climate policy through our current political system um, and our current culture, which for all the problems does elect these politicians. Um, there are wider shifts in our cultural values and our sense of what's unfolding on the planet that are necessary before all the really wonderful people that I know who are working on great climate policy are gonna be able to actually deliver what they know how to deliver. Uh, and so at that point in my life, um, I, I wrote a peer reviewed paper about, about text, about this carbon rationing system so that I sort of put on the record everything I knew about that uh, about five years ago. Um, and I stepped back from that uh, arena and I thought, okay, what can I do to try and shift these, these, these wider stories in our culture of what's meaningful and what's important? Uh, and around that time, a little earlier, my, um, my mentor, David Fleming, who I mentioned earlier, passed away. Uh, and he had been working on a, a book for over 30 years called uh, Lean Logic, A Dictionary for the Future and How to Survive It. And he never let me look at it, actually, uh, while he was alive, because he said we were too close and uh, we would fall out <laughs> if I looked at it and I was critical because it was too close to his heart. And so after he died, I, he, he never got the book published and I found the manuscript uh, in his house, which I was helping to uh, clear out his possessions. And I decided I was allowed to read it at this point and was absolutely struck by how directly this um, speaks to exactly the issues I felt called to engage with. Um, I mean, David was someone who was involved in um, getting the Green Party up and running in the UK. Uh, he was a former chair of the Soil Association. He was involved in the creation of the New Economics Foundation. And basically he'd sort of, he was 20 or 30 years ahead of me. Um, and he'd been 
frustrated back in the 70s and 80s to find that it was always the economists who were telling us, you know, we can't do what's necessary for, for the ecology um, because of growth. Uh, and so he, his friend Jonathan Porritt remembers him back at an early Green Party conference or Ecology Party conference, as I believe it was at the time, standing up and saying to the others there, we have to learn the language of economics. Like we need to meet these people on their own grounds because they're wrong, but we need to know how to show them that they're wrong. Um, and he was true to his word. He went then off and got himself a PhD in economics. Um, and uh, I guess quite unusually managed to do that without absorbing all the, um, the paradigms of mainstream economics and uh, you know getting subsumed into the system. Uh, he really learned learn the system in order to challenge it from the inside out and most importantly to figure out the answer to this impossible dilemma like what does life after economic growth look like what could it look like how does how does that work and the other thing that's quite exciting about David's work is that he his background before that was as a historian and so his starting point for answering that question was to say not like how do I invent some brilliant new economics but hang on, like this growth-based capitalist market economy has only actually been around for a couple of hundred years. So how did the whole thriving of, of humanity in the natural world function before that? Like we know that it's possible. That's what almost all of history was. Um, and that, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an incredibly multifaceted book, but that's one of the stories that this dictionary for the future and how to survive it tells. Uh, unfortunately, when I was speaking to publishers, they they were saying this is incredible, but it's it's huge and it's in this strange sort of interlinked dictionary format. Uh, it's a little bit like Wikipedia. When you're reading each entry, there's a star next to other entries that relate to it. So you can kind of choose your own adventure through the book. Um, and so there was some hesitation from publishers when I was trying to get it published. Uh, and so out of that book, I edited this one, uh, which is called Surviving the Future culture, carnival and capital in the aftermath of the market economy. And here I really pulled out that story from his work, like what might a post growth economics look like that isn't so much about what we might lose, uh, but is much more about what we've lost already and might regain because we talk a lot about sustainability um, and almost all of the talk about sustainability, I think, is based on completely the wrong aim. I think sustainability is completely the wrong aim if we're talking about sustainability of, of our economy, of our way of life. And it's the wrong aim for three reasons. Uh, firstly, most obviously, it's the wrong aim because it's impossible for the reasons that we've touched on already. Uh, secondly, it's the wrong aim because it's undesirable. I mean, we're living in a society that is incredibly exploitative, incredibly destructive, and has higher rates of mental illness and suicide than any ever. So why would our aim be to sustain that? And thirdly, it's the wrong aim because it's downright uninspiring. I mean, sustainability, is, if, if that's as high as we can set our aims in life, there's something very wrong. Uh, there's um, a permaculture teacher who, who once said, um, if someone asks you how your, how your marriage is or how your relationship's going, and your answer is, yeah, it's sustainable. It's not great, right? <laughs> we can do better than that. Like we can do better than, I mean, it's, it's better than we're so dysfunctional that we leave a trail of destruction everywhere we go, for sure. It's progress. But I don't want to just live a life that sustains a system that I despise. I want to live something beautiful. I want to live a completely different thing. And this is why, um, as I've been gone on, being quite involved with Extinction Rebellion, as I've mentioned, um, one of the things I often talk about there is, you know, what are we rebelling against and what are we rebelling for? And for me, it's not fundamentally about climate change, although, again, climate change is absolutely an essential part of it. But climate change is a symptom and climate change is a symptom of our economy and our economy is a symptom of our cultural stories, our values. Um, yeah, we... we we, we have this sort of, I guess, default path laid out for us, um, which is essentially that uh, 
that the most important thing that we can that we can achieve the, the the essential thing we have to do before we can think about anything else is to achieve financial independence right if you're not that then you're a, you're a, you're a sponge or you're a parasite um you know firstly you have to go out earn your living do your work uh, and then once you've done that if you've got a bit of spare time a bit of spare money then you can you can think about doing something else with your life and that cultural story i think is incredibly dangerous and incredibly deluded um and i think it's deluded because <laughs> another controversial statement here after sustainability being the wrong aim financial independence doesn't exist uh and so it's a very strange aim for us to choose and what i mean when i say it doesn't exist is that no matter how rich you are no matter how rich anyone is they're still dependent on other people and on the natural world um you can afford to buy all your food but someone else still grew that food and delivered it you can afford to buy a house but someone else still built that house so you're still very much interdependent and actually all that money allows us to do is be dependent on people we don't know instead of being dependent on people that we do know uh any of us who've lived in poverty know that when you don't have money to meet your needs what you do is you meet it through relationships you you support each other you make things work together um and anyone who's lived with extreme wealth knows that it can be incredibly lonely because you don't really need anyone because you have needs you have dependencies still but everyone's replaceable because there's always someone else you could pay to do it uh, and you're never really sure whether anyone really wants you in their life or they're just there for money and so it's actually not a nice place to be and yet that's what we're told our aim should be that's what we're told we should work at we should grind out every day to achieve is that unhappy state of being of pretending that we're independent of other people um <laughs> so what we're rebelling against to my mind is the stories of our culture is the stories of what's important of what's meaningful um you know the 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 idea i mean i often say we you cannot not change the world <laughs> whatever approach you take if you take the most default down the line do what they tell you approach to life then that's the kind of world that you're creating and the consequences that we're seeing for our world are the kind of consequences that you're supporting um and we're entering into a time i think where that's going to become more and more obvious uh it's going to become more and more obvious that the 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 mainstream way of life is making people incredibly unhappy at the expense of people who have less money and at the expense of our future um and i think you know one one thing that makes that very obvious is if we look at people's underlying expectations of the future um you know i talk to people older than me and they tell me that 40 50 years ago it was just kind of a given nobody talked about it really but it was just a given that you know your kids would be better off than you were um that was just an underlying expectation all other things being equal and if you talk to people now i would say there's an underlying expectation of well i'm glad i'm not going to be around to see the consequences that shift is not the mark of a civilization that is making good choices that is not a show that we need to sustain or keep on the road and i well, wanted to emphasize actually when ed read the uh scientist warning statement on the economy i loved that when they talked about sustainability they were very careful to specify the sustainability of the biosphere the sustainability of nature is what we absolutely need to preserve as well as the well-being of of humans um that absolutely needs sustaining but this economy not so much and what we need at this moment i think is a lot more imagination uh, my friend rob hopkins wrote a book recently called imagination taking power and that's a, a beautiful exploration of how desperately we need to see beyond the cultural stories that were being sold um because they they're making us miserable uh quite apart from everything else um there's this saying attributed to several people um that it's easier now to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism 
And that's powerful because there's some truth to that. But it needn't be so. We can develop our imaginations. And, you know, this, this book is, is one of my contributions to that uh, radical imagination of, of what the sequel to this troubled civilization might look like. Uh, we also made a film with that name, the sequel, what will, trouble, tr what will follow our troubled civilization. Um, and as I'd mentioned, we're running uh, these courses in collaboration with Sterling College called Surviving the Future Conversations for Our Time, which again are all about developing that imagination because without it, our disgust at what's unfolding on the planet very easily turns into self-loathing. If we, if we imagine that humans can't be anything other than what humans are now, then it's completely understandable when, again, within XR, there have been some people talking about, you know, humanity is the virus. I think that's an incredibly dangerous perspective, not because this culture isn't spreading over the planet and exponentially growing as a parasite and destroying everything around it, because it is, but that's not humanity, that's this culture. And that is such an important distinction because if we imagine it's humanity, then it's me, right? Then it's you. And it's really easy to see why that leads to self-hatred and even suicide. But if we recognize that it's this culture, then we can very much take that loathing and say, well, I want nothing to do with this, this ecocidal, omnicidal culture. I want no part of it. And it's very easy then to look at, well, who are the power brokers here? Who are the politicians? Who are the corporations that are, that are driving this culture in this direction and to resist them? And so it's such a different impetus if we recognize that it's the culture that's the virus, not humanity. Um, and again, it allows us the possibility to imagine beautiful lives for ourselves. Um, and I'm about out of time on my half hour talk. We're going to converse a lot more over the next half an hour, I hope. Um, but uh, just to very, <laughs> very briefly summarize what is a huge book um, in which I think is key to developing this, this creative imagination for ourselves. Uh, I would say that the essence of David's vision is that in the absence of economic growth, what sustains communities and economies and societies is culture, is music, is art, is play, is joy, is conversation. Um, and that sounds really, um, I don't know, naive or unrealistic maybe, um, when we're so used to talking about economics in terms of finance, in terms of money. Um, but all I can say really in, in a couple of minutes is that uh, these books really from the point of view of someone who took the time to go and get a PhD in economics and ground this stuff and who writes beautifully, really puts foundations under that. Um, that actually the, the secure place to look for, look for our security moving into the future is, is not finance because it's a pyramid scheme that's crumbling. And it's certainly not national politics. And I don't suppose I have to say much about that right now. The place to look for security in our future is in each other and in the natural world, in the ways that we relate to each other that aren't mediated by money. And of course, both of those are hugely uh, under assault right now, both the natural world and the, the non-monetary economy. Um, and so for me, the most important work we can do in preparing for the incredibly challenging future that we're moving into is defending and sustaining and, and re re-strengthening the natural world and defending and sustaining and re-strengthening those ties of informal relationship and joy and culture and music and play um, that make life worth living and that we desperately miss in this economy, which is so obsessed with, with money. Um, as David says towards the end of the book, um, in the future, we could move into a time when there will be time for music again. And I think that's a good note on which to end. And I haven't been paying any attention to the chat, um, but hopefully Ed can tell me a bit about what's been going on there. And uh, maybe I can answer a few questions. Brilliant, Sean. Very, very, very good. Um, the, yeah, we haven't actually had so many questions in the chat and I've probably been um, 
putting in more comments than anybody else. So, um, <laughs> Just think, you and me chatting there, Ed. Excellent. It looks like it will be. I think, I think. I mean, and anybody should, I think, now chime in if they'd like to. There are one or two questions which we'll, we'll take in. And I just want to applaud you uh, for the way you've looked at this and presented it. Um, and I did put into the chat one um, comment about it, which was that Earth Overshoot Day was the 22nd of August. So we effectively were unsustainable this year from the 22nd of August and the next four months, we are all living unsustainably and we should really turn the lights out and stop doing anything at all to stay within our limits. Um, but that actually has been going on for years and years and years. And although it's actually slipped to the 22nd of August, every year for the last two decades, we've been overshooting or even longer. Um, so we really need to be um, thinking about that as we're thinking about it. And I love the idea that um, sustainable is not the aim that we should want to achieve because who wants to be sustainable? I can only agree with you. And it may be that many people's experience through COVID-19, and it was certainly mine for the first couple of months, of the, of the lockdown was actually how much more enjoyable it was when I didn't rush to that, rush to this, had more time with my kids, did go for walks in the countryside and actually had the time to look up and see the tops of the trees and what was going on rather than rushing out for my fitted in exercise. Um, so you're so absolutely right. I'm totally on the same thing. The, um, the one thing that I put to you maybe as a question um, is, we need, from what the United Nations has told us, and the United Nations is correct or inherently, inherently conservative in what it's saying to us. So if the United Nations has given us 10 years to limit ourselves to 1.5 to 2 degrees, that's a big program of action. And if we all stop tomorrow and dismantle capitalism tomorrow, we could probably do it. Well, the fact is in the UK, um, let's talk about our situation here, which is not unlike some of the other countries. Um, we have a capitalist system. We have... Um, a, a Tory party that will be in power probably for the next 10 years. Um, and we have a very powerful prime minister and I'm not drawing party lines in terms of voting, but in order to get the type of work we need doing by the United Nations, do we not need to work within that system now and urgently to give us the time to reach the more desirable situation that you're painting? A very familiar question. Um, so firstly, I just wanted to pick up on that thing about the 22nd of August and sustainability, which I've always found a, a slightly problematic application of the word unsustainable because, um, I mean, it's a way to try and communicate something underlying, which is incredibly important, which is the fundamental unsustainability of way of life. But to say we passed into unsustainability on a particular date in the past and yet we're still here kind of <laughs> kind of makes people think oh well unsustainability isn't really very important then it's just this kind of optional thing you know like people want it but we're still here so it seems to be fine um so yeah i, I just i always found that slightly uncomfortable and just thought i'd i'd mention that um so in terms of your your main question uh i mean this is i think um the key argument that all environmentalists are constantly having, um, whatever element of the unfolding disaster they're talking about, you've got on the one hand, you'll have someone saying, you know, there's no time to wait for radical change or revolution. The crisis is overwhelmingly urgent. We simply have to act within the frameworks that we have now because there just isn't time to wait for anything else, right? Mm -hmm. And they're right. And on the other hand, on the other side of the argument, you'll have someone saying, but there's no point in acting without radical change or revolution, because without that, we're just addressing symptoms. We're not really getting to the fundamental root of the problem. And we're just going to create more problems with whatever we do within those frameworks. And they're right. <laughs> and so I've actually kind of got a bit bored of those arguments because I think there's a, there's a truth underpinning both sides of the argument that nobody's willing to admit which is that they're both right. Like we, we need absolutely radical change and there isn't time for absolutely radical change. Like I think most of us here can probably recognize that both of those things are true. So let's stop arguing about which of them is true and actually sit with the much more difficult question was, which is, wait, where does that leave us? Uh, like if it if it's too late well what then like despair giving up like what what then 
And that I think leads us into a much more potent space of honest reflection on where we are today. Um, again, that if we if we make sustainability our, our God, then we will fail our God. There is no way of sustaining this system from where we are now. And I kind of hesitate to say more because I think when we get to that point, it's, it's not really a point for conversation. It's more a dark night of the soul um, that I think anyone who's been involved with this work for a long time has faced. Like that point of, I don't, I don't think I can fix this and I'm not sure anyone can fix this. And maybe this actually isn't a problem that needs a solution. Maybe this is a, a predicament. Like the fact that I'm gonna die, that isn't a problem that needs a solution. That's just a fact that I have to come to terms with and figure out what meaning looks like in the context of that difficult truth. And that I think is where we're at um, with regard to the kinds of questions that we're talking about. Um, I think we're, we're, we're not on the cusp of collapse. I think we're in the midst of collapse. I think um, the science fiction writer, William Gibson said, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And for a lot of people, it's downright insulting to say, well, where's your collapse then mate? Um, because it's already happened. And it's happening for more and more people. And I, I prefer to think about sort of shrinking circles of affluence in which some of us are still living. And so the question is not, how do we stick to 1.5 degrees? Because to my eyes, that battle is long lost. Um, I was a climate campaigner throughout the 2000s and, you know, was going to the Copenhagen Climate Summit. What was that? can't even remember anymore, 2009. And, you know, I believe that was our last chance. And I, I still believe that. I don't, I don't buy this sort of mainstream funding dependent NGO idea that every one is our last chance. And that if we fail our last chance, well, we'll just go on to the next last chance. Like that isn't how sustainability or consequences work. Um, and so again, where does that leave us? I mean, I would, have done just about anything to avoid getting to where we are now in terms of the climate situation. Um, but that was not the choice that we collectively made. So the good news <laughs> is that the fact that I'm going to die, the fact that you're going to die, doesn't make our life meaningless. Um, quite the opposite. I have friends who are no longer alive and their lives weren't meaningless for that reason either. So there's no, there's no truth, there's no hope in fighting against the reality that we face. But if we can face it and then wake up one day and go, okay, actually there are things I really can't change. And I've accepted that now and it hurt like hell, but I've accepted that now. Then the next question is, okay, what now? You know, I'm still here, I'm still alive. I've still got things to do with my life. And then maybe we do spend our time, you know, trying to reduce emissions or, or preserve dying species or, or write injustices or, or work for revolution or reform. Like maybe those are the stories we want our life to tell, but now we're telling it from such a different energy, um, a sort of a, a deeper hope, a post doom perspective, some people call it. Um, and I've found that coming from that energy is both liberating and motivating and joyous. Um, because when we are, as so many environmentalists are looking at the evidence coming in and you know, the, the climate science looked bloody awful 15 years ago, and the predictions then have turned out worse than they were predicted to. Um, and it can be depressing, as I'm sure many people listening know, to constantly be trying to believe, like, we can do this, we can, and then see more evidence and going, oh, maybe, oh, but I can't think about that. I have to stay hopeful. It's exhausting to constantly push down your own understanding of what you believe is actually happening. But when you're coming from the energy of, okay, maybe I can't actually save the world. Maybe this can't actually be fixed. But nonetheless, I'm gonna tell the story with my life that I wanna to tell today. Then there's no evidence coming in that's, that takes you away from that. Like I'm not giving this talk because I think it's gonna mean that we stick to 1.5 degrees. To me, that's, that's laughable. There's no chance of it. I'm doing this because I believe it's meaningful and important for people to talk about the times that they're in with honesty and truth and make decisions about living lives they wanna live. And, no evidence is going to make me have to doubt that.
And so my motivation is solid and pure and beautiful. I can be completely upfront about it. And I'm not kind of saying one thing to you in public and then going off behind closed doors and getting drunk with my friend and going, ah, we're fucked, you know, because there's a lot of that going on. Um, so that's that's my answer is that I um, I don't think that we're going to get to 1.5 degrees, whether we work for revolution or whether we work for reform. Um, I think we're heading into that time. And that doesn't mean I'm going to stop doing things that contribute to the effort because I want to, because that's who I want to be. Um, but I'm going to do things that make sense, even if we don't achieve that aim, like something that reduced emissions by 20%. I have no particular interest in anymore because I think we're going to get to a point where feedback mechanisms like methane hydrate release, et cetera, et cetera, get to the point where they're emitting far more than humans are anyway. So that would be an approach that wouldn't make sense in a future scenario that I see as very likely. Um, but doing this kind of work, well, if there were a great cultural turning to sanity, I'd like to feel I played a part in it. And if there isn't, this still feels like meaningful work. And that would be my advice is do work that contributes whatever the future scenario. And so the true sense of resilience, actually, like people think that resilience means predicting the future accurately and preparing for it. And it doesn't. Resilience means preparing for the widest possible range of possible futures. Um, and I think since we all know that there's at least a very big chance that we miss these targets, let's take that into account in our decision making wholeheartedly. Great, thank you. Um, great. I, I think actually there's been quite a lot of just different comments coming in rather than that many questions. Um, I'd just like to, to um, go back to something you said about when you um, gave up your salary, started to live effectively a very um, low cost life and that sort of thing and actually compare it maybe to my own ecological conversion, um, whereas this is this sort of appropriate conversation for us, I think. Um, in the, for me, in the middle of last year, actually running my own company at the time, the, um, and having discovered a lot more about the science, a lot of which you allude to here, and we now all know from the scientists' warnings, where each of the warnings of the world scientists happens to confirm the previous warnings were right and tell us that we've not done enough and now it's situation's worse. Um, and I woke up, um, one day from a nightmare and I have a, an 11 year old and a 13 year old boy and I woke up nearly two years ago now um, in my nightmare they just arrived back to our home and they were in their army um, uniforms and they were dumping their bags in the hall and coming in to find me as a much older man having a beer in, in the living room watching telly or something like that um, and they came up to me and explained to me that they'd just been in Germany um, shooting people who wanted to get the drinking water that they were protecting to make sure that those in the affluent, more affluent areas were able to get their drinking water. And they would say to me, they'd say, Dad, um, we're over in Germany, or maybe not Germany, but we're over shooting people to stop them getting drinking water so that you can maintain your lifestyle in this country. And not only could we get killed doing it, but we're effectively shooting people who are poorer than us and have smaller guns than us to keep them away from the drinking water. And in my mind, as I was waking up, I could hear my excuses were, oh, yes, but, you know, and then they asked me then, they, they would say to me, and 20 years ago, didn't you know that this was happening? Um, and I would, waking up, I was saying, yes, but we had a mortgage and I needed to do it. And there was a leasing on the car and I had my own company and, you know, and I'm a single dad and I had to cook your dinner and get you to school. And then in my mind, I just knew as I was repeating these excuses to me that that wouldn't wash. And I now needed to, like, you said give up on that and focus on on the really important aspect whether or not i believe your philosophy related to it the the, the issue is all the same and we're all um, working on exactly the same the same area and um, so that's my personal bit i just wanted to, to to sort of share then that actually brings me back then to maybe a question um linked to something somebody else has said as well about focus and focusing on the right and the most important thing but i do want to read out nigel george's comment first um, because I think it's relevant. Um, and he says, I think imagination is probably the greatest sustainable, renewable natural earth resource our planet has to offer us, at least the human one. Um, I think imagination can very easily be refined into creativity and creativity is probably the best sort of fuel needed to power meaningful change. And then to bring it back to my first thought, and it relates even to the issues of capitalism. Um, in capitalism, focus and mission are, are a big issue. Um, but in fact, the idea of focus, if we all focus on what's important and we have a very, very clear focus, for instance, Extinction Rebellion's demand for 2025 net zero. 
singular focus. If that is what we all agree is our target, then as Nigel was suggesting, and you have to some extent, our, our creativity wakes up and we find out how to get there. And if that means dismantling capitalism and doing it that way, we get there. And if that means doing it within capitalism, we do it another way. If that means technical innovation, we do it. If that means um, consuming a lot less, changing our lifestyles, having half the amount of time we work and expending more time at leisure. All of that is part of the imagination that comes with great focus. Um, do you think that's the way we should be looking at our solutions? Uh, it's a qualified yes. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, I mean, actually the reason that David's Dictionary for the Future and How to Survive It is called Lean Logic is because uh, he was very impressed by this model that came out of industrial thinking, of lean thinking. And the very first principle of that is setting a clear intention. And as you say, if you set a clear intention, then you can reveal um, astonishing solutions that you could never have imagined were there. Um, especially if you don't try and approach the solution in a top-down way, but you know, get collective agreement on the intention and work together to, to, to create it. So yes, it's an incredibly powerful tool. However, <laughs> um, I could set a clear intention that I don't want to die and I'm going to just figure out how to never die. That doesn't mean that it's possible. Um, and I think we need to be honest about that. Um, and for me, the line that I always come back to is by a, a writer I deeply love called Wendell Berry, uh, who's a farmer over in Kentucky in the United States. Uh, and he said, he wrote, protest that endures, I think, is driven by a hope more modest than that of public success. The hope of preserving something in one's heart and spirit that would be destroyed by acquiescence. And again, for me, that's a deeper motivation than the need to succeed. And there's a danger in clear intentions that they hide you from the possibility that actually maybe you're not going to achieve the intention. And actually you can sometimes do great damage in still striving for an intention after it's impossible. Um, and so yes, intentions are incredibly important, but we also need to be aware of the possibility that not all intentions are achieved. <laughs> um, and it was interesting he said about the scientist warning, always confirming that the previous scientist warning was right because uh, these books actually came to publication through something that some of you might know called the Dark Mountain Movement. Um, and uh, they published a book and the theme of the book was post cautionary tales. They said, we've heard all the cautionary tales. Now we want the stories about what happens after we ignore them. <laughs> Um, and that was the first category I've ever heard of, actually, that these books actually fit perfectly. They are definitely post-cautionary tales. Um, they're sort of on the border between fiction and non-fiction. They're on the border between all kinds of things. Um, but they are definitely post-cautionary tales. And, um, yeah, I also I just wanted to really uh, thank you and honour you for um, sharing your nightmare. Um, because I think, you know, I, I mentioned that the sort of dark night of the soul that certainly I've been through around this and you clearly have as well, or are going through. Um, and I don't know, to me talking at that level, um, being really honest about our deepest fears is, is, is where the really good stuff happens far more than talking about, you know, models for degrowth or, or carbon rationing policy or, um, you know, all the other important things that we talk about. But as I say, it's, it's our fundamental shifts in, what we regard as important, what we prioritize and what we deprioritize. Like that's the level at which change is needed right now. Um, and that's why for me, when you talk about focus, um, you know, that is my focus, like cultivating, creating spaces for the conversations we need to have, um, cultivating that imagination, um, creating spaces where people can talk about their fears. Um, because, because if we don't have those spaces, then, we, we don't really have anything of meaning. I've actually, I've just um, uh, written out some links to some of my, um, some of these resources, almost all of which are available free for people, um, which I'll post in the chat now. Um, and I'll just, I'll just mention what they are. Uh, so there's my website at the top. Uh, the next run of Surviving the Future Conversations for Our Time is happening in January, if you're interested. 
Lean Logic Online is for people who, so this is a big book and it's a fairly expensive book. It's like 20 quid, 25 quid. Um, it's available completely free there at leanlogic.online um, because a fan of the book created it as a series of interlinked websites. So whereas in the book, there's a star to link you to a different entry uh, on the website, there's just a link. So you can click from, from entry to entry and that's a wonderful resource. Um, there's the film, which I've accidentally put a line break in, uh, which is called the sequel, What Will Follow This Troubled Civilization. And again, if you go to that link and click the link that says tonight's launch, you can watch it for free there. And for anyone who's um, on Reddit, um, I'm gonna be doing an AMA, which is an Ask Me Anything, which is basically a big conversation um, on Reddit on the, it's not totally confirmed, but almost certainly on those dates. So if anyone wants to connect or follow up or read or watch something connected with this, then um, those are the resources that I've helped to develop and I'm offering to the world in terms of what I see as my critical focus. Great, thank you very much, Sean. Thanks for sharing that. I, I will actually bring you back. We didn't get very many questions. So apologies to some people if your comments aren't read out, but they're comments that everybody's reading. So to some extent, they're part of the conversation already. Brian McGavin, they did ask a number of questions and I think it may be worth touching on straight onto one of them. Does your thinking acknowledge the moral right for our wildlife to have a sustainable future? Absolutely. Um, I mean, you may have noticed that when I was talking about population, I was talking about human population, um, because I think it's, it's really important that when we talk about populations, we acknowledge that the populations of almost every other animal on the planet uh, have been in decline for a very long time, apart from the cattle that we farm, et cetera. Um, and yes, to me, that is also one of the fundamental cultural stories that we need to challenge today is this idea that um, <laughs> we should start a non-human lives matter movement. Right. Okay. So animal rebellion, though, which is already existing, isn't it? Absolutely. Animal rebellion are doing great work. Um, and uh, yeah, I could talk a lot about that, but thank you for raising it. It's incredibly important that we don't you know, we talk about racism and sexism and ageism, and we very rarely talk about speciesism. And I think it's equally, um, if not more critical, because these are our life support systems. Absolutely. Yeah, and sure. that everyone's life, I mean, when I say everyone, I don't just mean human ones, <laughs> it's everyone's life support system. So, and, it, and in fact, just while we're there, the, of course, on uh, tomorrow is our nature day, starting with the insect apocalypse. So, um, which has all of it in its title. Um, now, I'd just like to ask you something else, which I, I believe I read in one of your papers, and apology if I didn't, but if I didn't read it in one of yours, then please comment on it, um, was the, um, look, going back historically and looking at um, how people used to live, they had vast amounts of time left for family and recreation, took large amounts of their time off to go and do things two, three, four months a year, and had vast amounts of time during the day. Now, I, I, I believe it was one of your papers, but I'm not sure. Um, and that's obviously, was. It, it was excellent. So, and obviously to me, in my mind, if that can be recreated, so, you know, the idea of the job share and the fact that um, everybody, all of humanity could profit from actually having less time on the job and more time for um, unconsuming or, or less consumptive um, recreation, surely that must be where we'd all want to profit. That must be our aim. Absolutely. Um, I mean, <laughs> You know, economists talk about the, the problem of unemployment, uh, which, you know, is the, 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 the problem that everyone isn't spending every possible hour working. Um, many of us might consider that to be spare time and something that we actually want in our lives. Um, and again, this, this very much actually, I'll, I, I know exactly the, uh, um, the peace of mind that you're quoting, and I'll put the link to that in the, um, in the chat as well for people who are interested to read it. Um, because that's really a, a quick summary of um, sort of David Fleming's vision for what uh, the post, post and to some extent pre-capitalist economy might look like. Um, and uh, yeah, it's this idea that, you know, if we're basing things continually on growth, part of the reason is because governments see that as the only way to keep unemployment from rising to the point where the, the system breaks down. Um, because in our, in our current system as as technology improves, uh, let's say that a particular technology allows a person to do twice as much useful work in a day. Um, well, that sounds great. And that's why historically people like John Maynard Keynes predicted that by now 
people would only be working like a few hours a day because technology would be doing all the work and we'd just be, you know, reading poetry and making love. Um, so why are we not there? You know, it's not because technology hasn't advanced as fast as Keynes thought it would by any means. Um, the reason that we're there, again, is because of our economic paradigm um, and that at the moment, if productivity improves massively because of technology, all that happens is that half the people get put out of work and the, <clears throat> the owner of the business um, makes huge profits. We get a more unequal society. Lots of people become unemployed and they either just get hungry or become dependent on government for, for benefits. Um, <clears throat> and the only way that the government can continue to pay all those benefits is through economic growth. And so the government's again, from with an only limited understanding of this stuff, they go, well, if we don't keep growing, then we're not gonna be able to pay benefits. And then the whole thing breaks down and that's just not even thinkable. So obviously let's keep growing. Um, and again, this is one of the reasons why, as I sort of hinted at the start of the talk, there were very real reasons why, why the end of economic growth is a, is a major challenge. Um, but as I said, again, the, the, the alternative um, is, to, is to base things in, in culture and in community. And a huge expansion of the the, the non-monetary economy, the things, the things that we do when we're not otherwise compelled, you know, music, play, volunteering, activism, friendship, um, because those then become the things which bind people together in, in cooperation and, and support and solidarity. And as you say, historically, there were months of holidays in the year, um, which at the time tended to be sort of channeled into religious festivals and carnival and, and this kind of thing. Um, and that bonded people so that in difficult times, the relationships were there that they could, they could draw on in supporting each other rather than relying on a bank balance to support them, which is of course what we're taught to do today. You know, if you're, if you're a, a, a sensible right thinking person, you're thinking about your pension and, and your, your employment and your medical insurance, if you're in the US and all of that stuff. Um, but that's the modern story of where we should find security and the, the older story, and I say older, not in the sense of um, outdated, but in the sense of the story with a 100,000 year track record of success, as opposed to our current story, which has a 200 year track record of annihilating life on the planet. Um, the, the, the story with a track record of success is getting to know each other, enjoying time together, playing together, having time for all the things that we miss in this in this current economy and the more that we build our dependencies on that and on the natural world um the more the unfolding collapse of the mainstream economy becomes less something to fear because we're becoming less dependent on it and actually more something to celebrate maybe because um because it's the end of the thing that's destroying everything we love um, so yeah, in many ways, this is less about what we need to sacrifice, which I think is another of the mistakes environmentalism has made. Um, sacrifice is an important thing. It literally means making sacred. I mean, I, I sacrificed flying 20 years ago and out of joy because I, I didn't want to live with that cognitive dissonance in me anymore. And that's the thing. We, we need to build a movement that's based in joy and that is far more about regaining the joys that we've lost in the modern world. Um, rather than about trying to defend a modern world that is pretty much sick on every level. Um, I know we're running a bit over time, but a few extra sort of fairly good comments are coming in, which are probably worth as well um, mentioning. So Ronnie Lee has said, would you agree that um, human supremacism, or supremacism, the view that humans are somehow more important than other sentient animals is a fundamental cause of the ecological problems we're seeing now? Um, and then Nigel George has really added to that, saying, let's stop making a distinction between us humans and them, the rest of the natural world. Um, and to be honest, um, anybody who is firstly looking at the mechanics of it, like they will do on nature tomorrow, is if we try to look at ourselves in a different way, um, then the mechanics of the biology of the planet mean that we're going to suffer anyway, as the insect apocalypse Dave Goulson will be talking about. If you go and you go into religious fields and you look at the Pope saying exactly the same thing in Laudato Si, that in fact, the ecology and us yeah. are totally linked and we shouldn't be trying to lord it over the, eco over the ecology, but we should be um, looking after it and nurturing it, which brings us back to and enjoying it and getting, um, you know, our um, benefits out of it in the way you're just suggesting. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with you and I agree with Nigel George that um, 
you know, I, you know, I, I, I try to smatter my speech with things that hint this to people, as you might have noticed, I don't talk about animals, I talk about non-human animals, because we're animals too. Um, and again, as Lord Atto see is an incredible document. Um, and uh, again, this all comes back to what is my focus, which is our, our fundamental cultural stories of what's important. Um, and of course, that absolutely feeds into religion and spirituality, because that's, that's really what those are about as well. Um, and actually the religion entry in the dictionary for the future and how to survive it uh, is one of the most, it really changed my perspective on things. Um, and in terms of the, where we draw the border between self and other, between us and them, particularly between me and the world, um, I, I tend to think of me more like a Russian doll than a, than a, you know, economic unit, which seems to be how our culture recommends us to look at ourselves. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's Sean, there's me that, that ends at my skin, maybe. Um, but it's very clear that inside me, there's a huge ecosystem of, of bacteria and indeed viruses and many other things, cells, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, that are absolutely essential to Sean existing at all in any meaningful sense. Um, so there's no way that I can thrive without the Russian dolls that are inside me and which maybe I don't understand very well. Um, and then equally the Russian dolls go outwards as well. So, you know, what, what hope would Sean have of existing without, without Gaia, without the planet? You know, if I'm floating in space, I don't live very long. Um, so it's completely obvious to anyone who thinks about it for a moment that Sean is not an independent being. Sean is a dependent being that depends on things both smaller and larger than Sean. Um, and so in what sense is Sean a separate being? Well, that's a long, complex philosophical argument which I, or discussion which I would gladly have with anyone because it's one of my favorite topics. Um, but essentially, I absolutely agree. Um, like, I mean, us and them, is it even a useful concept at all? One could ask, um, but, uh, but absolutely, the, if we are gonna talk about us and them, we need to, at the very least, recognize the, the pragmatic things that Ed's talking about, um, that we are, simply straightforwardly demonstrably interdependent um okay we just have one or two more comments i think we'll take just the last two with short answers um before we wrap up just on timing uh, well saunders has asked if you happen to know um a guy called rob greenfield who's living an extremely minimal life relying on relationships and trading skills uh, the answer is no i don't um i mean my best friend is a guy called mark boyle uh, who's often known as the moneyless man and he lived without money for three years and is now living without without electricity, like not off grid, but without electricity or running water. Um, and we have sort of created a little a little community around a, a sort of free pub called the Happy Pig in Ireland. Um, uh, Rob Greenfield, I'm pretty sure Mark has mentioned to me, um, but I don't know him personally. And I've noted the link and we'll be uh, browsing that website with interest. Thank you. Um, okay, and then I think we're probably taking this just as the last comment, and it's quite specific from Belinda. Uh, the universal basic income idea is being discussed in Parliament. The MPs concerned are really keen to hear people's ideas, and there are a few petitions doing the rounds. Um, I feel it's really worth pushing this idea to help the Green New Deal type ideas and encourage people to volunteer in their communities or retrain or do what they enjoy. So comment if you'd like to say a word on that. Uh, yeah, my take on that is slightly complex, actually. Um, I, I, I instinctively support UBI, Universal Basic Income, in that uh, a lot of my work has been about helping people to escape from the rent and mortgage trap. You know, the fact that just in order to exist, we have to sell our labor in the market economy. Um, and that prevents so many people from doing what they love. And that's something I'm profoundly opposed to. And in fact, we're the only species that isn't allowed to just go and build itself a home and live in it, which is worth noting. Um, so on that level, uh, I have a lot of sympathy with the idea. My hesitation is that it strikes me as an idea that if that universal basic income is coming from a centralized body like the government, that it encourages this sense in people of dependence and loyalty on that uh, infrastructure. It also encourages the sense that the fundamental thing that people need for their security is financial income, um, which is a story I'm really trying to challenge. Um, uh, I'm much more interested in the idea of universal basic services, um, which is where you know people would 
have free public transport and you know free access to the things that they need to survive I mean if we could get away from that being about money and make it about getting the things we actually need you know which come down to air and food and water and shelter and companionship then um then I'd be a lot more excited about it so at the moment UBI is something it very much depends the devil is in the detail um so I'm not uh I'm not wholeheartedly in favor of all things UBI but there's something very important in there and it, more to tease out there than I could get into in the allotted few seconds. <laughs> right, no, that's fine. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Sean. I think we'll we'll start drawing it to a close there. That's absolutely brilliant. We've run a bit over time. Um, I think our um, definition of today as being about sustainable economy, you cast into doubt by looking at the word sustainable, um, and maybe we should be avoiding that, but maybe actually the word economy itself is actually pretty misleading in what we need to um, term as a lifestyle in the future that is more um, pleasurable. And well, it, it, it depends how you define economy as well. I mean, we need an economy for a sustainable biosphere um, and an economy fundamentally, a financial economy is only one kind of economy. Economy is about what we do, how we do it, what, who gets what. Um, we need an economy, it doesn't necessarily need to involve money. Absolutely. And that we need to redefine the word profit as well, away from money into profitable in other ways. You know, Aldo Leopold defined biology as animal economics, which I really like. Right. Um, so, yeah, let's look at the economic systems on this planet that actually work. Brilliant. Great. Thank you very much, Sean. That's absolutely brilliant. And that's um, you've come right in the middle of a, of a day of five talks.